wanted to share with you was to talk about the project that we've been working on with all to do with fatigue. And rather interestingly, we've had patients talk to us say, I don't have fatigue because I do this and I, I, I do mitigating behavior X and I also do that and I incorporate that into my life and that helps and so I don't have fatigue. And in a bizarre way, it's, it's a win-win because what we now know is that you have done and made a whole lot of changes which have improved your quality of life and that's fantastic. We know that the information you've had has helped you manage your fatigue, which is fantastic. But also when we're looking at describing to clinicians or academics or policymakers how it is to live with the PVC, we also have evidence of your fatigue and we're able to share that. So, so that's a really, really important part of, of what we're doing. Right, so we are just waiting for Dave to come back. Um, so I'm just going to message him. Um, to see if he is coming back into the room. Okay, bear with me. I detect a Prof Jones is in the ether. So, right, we're ready to go again. So, we will start again. And this time, there will be less introduction, less interlude, and we'll go straight and direct to your questions. But hopefully, that was helpful in terms of the introduction and, and just highlighting A, that fatigue is real, B, we hear you, and C, we are actually using the information that you give to us to, again, advocate on your behalf, campaign on your behalf. And, and make the best decisions possible to help you with the, the long-term journey. Okay, so we're just waiting for Dave Jones to come live again. It has been an interesting week for technology. He always scares me when he comes in with that concentration face. I'm, all, I'm not quite sure what he's going to, to say to us, but he is. you're frozen again visually, but hopefully we can hear you. So, Dave, can you talk to us? Maybe. Okay, you there, Dave? Um, can you hear me? Yep, we've got you now. We can hear you. So the the inter I'm gonna the internet. They've got huge. I'm sitting in the university, so. Um, bizarrely, if I'm in rural Northumberland, the internet seems to work better than a major university. So um, let me know. It's, it, I'm getting a strange image. I mean, it's not just me looking strange. It's a strange version of me. So it, please, can you, if you're struggling, can you put a message in? Because I'm still want me to know whether I'm getting through or not. Right. Okay. So just to um, let you know that you are looking as handsome and debonair as ever on Facebook. So I think the signal coming to us and going to Facebook is good. So, so we're good in the room, and it's just a case of... Um, yeah, just to finish what I was saying before, is fatigue in PVC is very, very yeah. real. And uh, I can also say the bad old days of people not taking it serious are going, I have to say, are going. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. We are recording again, and we are going to aim to be on target this time for our uh, about quarter past. Yeah. So... Okay, perfect. Thank you. Right. First question. Can we take coffee with milk or is it only black coffee that is recommended? If so, is there any reason for this? Um, there you go. If you could see inside my mug, it, it's black coffee. Um, you absolutely can drink milk. Personally, I can't stand milk in coffee, but that's a personal decision not to do with anything medical. I mean, dairy products are fine um, in PVC. Um, in fact, a reasonable amount of dairy is a good thing because of vitamin, you know, calcium and vitamin D. Um, it's, it's very safe. Um, just occasionally, 
people can get a bit fat and tolerant. Um, so the only reason why you might have to watch dairy intake is if you take full cream milk and you get a bit fat and tolerant with it. But um, but you're absolutely fine to do that. Okay, perfect. That's helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, next question, if I may, is to do with Urso. Actually, we've got a couple of questions about Urso. So the first of which is, my doctors have different opinions about when to take Urso. Some say before you eat, after you eat, um, all through the day, all at night time. What can you recommend? So the thing about Urso is that it was originally introduced for dissolving gallstones. Um, it wasn't originally introduced for PBC. Gallstones are commoner in PBC patients than in the ordinary population. Um, and so uh, Urso just very slowly dissolves gallstones. It's not a particularly effective treatment for that because it takes years. Um, but people observed that when PBC patients who happen to have gallstones or gallstone patients happen to have PBC rather took Urso, their PBC numbers improved. So it was one of those chance observations in medicine. So technically, Urso is still the approved treatment, medical treatment for dissolving gallstones, even though it's never used for that. Um, however, the dosing that's on the packet, so the dosing that's in the BNF, which is the doctor guide in the UK for how you use drugs, is, is still stuck for use for dissolving gallstones. So it's not correct for PBC, bizarrely, because nobody uses it for dissolving gallstones. So the reason why you get conflicting advice is because what the book says isn't actually what we recommend because we're using it for a different reason for what the book says. So our recommendation, which is we've always done, is to take your urso in the evening um, before you go to bed. So, you know, after a, an evening meal, not spaced out any particular timing. So take um, urso in the evening. There is no need to take it in multiple doses at all. And, um, you know, it's the little things about medicines that make a difference. So the easier they are to take, the more likely to remember to take them. So there is literally no need to take it three times a day. Um, and we tend to suggest take it in the evening because it then gets into the bile circulation very effectively. The other reason for spacing it out like that is if people are taking Questran, um, Urso and Questran bind to each other. So that, that's how Questran works. It binds bile acids and Urso is a bile acid. So if you take Questran and Urso together, the two bind together, just pass all the way through. Now that's not harmful, but it means you lose the effect of both. Now that's not the end of the world with Urso, but the same is true of Ochre. And that's a really expensive um, thing to do because Ochre is very expensive and it passes all the way, all the way through, you know, without having any action. So yep. we find take other tablets during the day. If you're taking Questran, space it during the day. Take Urso or Oka last thing in the evening as a single dose. Um, and that's been the recommendation we always give. Remember, unless it's your PVC doctor, the doctor and the pharmacist will be reading what books on, on the internet say. They won't know. And the book is just incorrect on this because it hasn't kept up with it all. So standard guidance. Now, the exception to that is if you're struggling to take Urso because GI irritation is one of the problems with it. If that's the case, then we suggest people ring the changes. So try different ways of taking it, different ways of doing it. So actually, if it works for you to take it with your breakfast in the morning, it's better than not taking it. So all things being equal, start in the evening and see how you go with that, but play around with it if that's the only way you can take it. The easiest thing to do if you are struggling to take Urso when you start is just start on a much lower dose. So start on a tiny dose. It, it, I'm, I wish it wasn't this way, but Urso is a treatment for life. So it matters less what you do this week or next week than the fact you get stable on it without any problems. So if you're struggling to start, start with a low dose and then sort of build it up um, from there over a few weeks and months. The other thing about Urso while we're on it is that it takes a long time to get into the system and a long time to get out. So if you do forget to take it or you, you know, run out of tablets or something like that, it is not a problem actually. As long as you pick it up a week or two off, it is not going to be met. Literally won't even be measurable because okay. it takes three months to reach a steady state. So don't panic if you run out. Just okay. pick it up when you can. 
Right, that's helpful. Um, and in terms of Urso and Oka together, is that a problem? No, no, they that's absolutely not a problem. So however you take Urso, however you take Oka, they don't interact. It's Questran with either um, Oka or Urso. Questran does not interact with Bezafibrate or Phenofibrate. Um, it doesn't interact, in fact, with any of the trial drugs that people are using at all it's simply um it's questran plus bile acids which in this setting is urso and oka okay that, that's helpful and over the counter travel sickness tablets if you're on urso and oka any thoughts on that yes so most um most over the counter travel sickness tablets are they're either antihistamines of one form or another um or alternatively, they're kind of mild versions of, of, of the sort of chlorpromazine you know, class of drugs. So metoclopramide types of things. They're all fine. Um, they are all inherently sedating. Um, that's how they work. They're sedating your vestibular apparatus so you don't feel sickly. So it's that it's your brain getting a signal that that you're moving in strange ways. So your ears have this sort of curious apparatus that looks like three snails at right angles to each other. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go onto the internet, it does look like three snails, um, which is, it, it's got three motion sensors for the three planes of movement. And it tells you if you're moving um, and that's for balance and things like that. And if those are a little bit oversensitive, um, then it can interpret particular types of movement as being unpleasant. So, um, and so, you know, people who get motion sickness, it's just you're getting too much of a signal. It's too finely tuned, if you like, too yeah. much of a signal going to the brain. So these are sedating drugs that sedate that signal. So, uh, and all sedative drugs will be a wee bit more sedative in PVC than in other diseases. Now, that's fine if you want to sleep while you're traveling. It's not so good if you want to drive. Yeah. So just be a little bit aware of that. Um, actually, these tablets, bizarrely, we use anti... I mean, when we talk about treatments to use for, for um, itch in PBC, we always say don't use antihistamines. Um, but in reality, we don't use antihistamines apart from the times we use antihistamines. And the times we use antihistamines are where people need to sleep. So yeah. um, a sedating antihistamine in the evening is actually very effective if people are itching at night. The point is we're making, it doesn't sound as illogical, it's not as illogical as it sounds. What we don't want is doctors to just go and give you antihistamines. They are useful, but you should think of them in particular situations. They should be kind of on the list of things you might think about at PVC, not the first thing. So it isn't about not using them, it's about using them smartly. But they can be really, really helpful in people if you're struggling to sleep. Okay, perfect. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, next question. My doctors advise it is best to be lean when you have PVC, but none of them offer to help me lose weight. I find that this is something here in the US that there is a big hole in care. Is there any guidance you can yeah. provide? So... Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's a very you know live a live one. Um, there is an association, loose association between PVC and fatty liver disease, um, but it is a very loose association. And so, but it's more so in America where fatty liver disease is commoner, although the UK is catching up. We're doing our best. Sorry. We're doing our best. Yeah, well, you and I are particularly, you know, nobly putting our shoulder to the wheel yeah. on the course. Leading, leading from the front, yeah. Um, so the combination of fatty liver disease plus PBC, you know, liver diseases can be additive like that. So it's, it's not an enormous problem in the UK, but we do see it. Um, fatty liver disease is also associated with fatigue, about 20% of fatty liver disease patients also get itch because you can get some of the cholestatic features. No fatty liver disease the doctor accepts the fatigue or itch happening in fatty liver disease, but they do. Um, and so it can kind of add to the problem set, okay? 
The other thing about fatty liver disease is it's very associated with type 2 diabetes and associated with heart disease. And you don't want type 2 diabetes because that's associated with fatigue. And then if you have high blood pressure, that the blood pressure tablets are associated with fatigue. So you want to try and avoid all of that if you can as part of being in the best physical shape you possibly can to, to deal with yeah. the symptoms. Yeah. So being lean is a very good way of reducing the risk of getting fatty liver disease. It doesn't eliminate it. You can get fatty liver disease with normal body weight um, if you are predisposed to it. But generally speaking, if you can avoid fat deposition in the liver, it will make the symptoms of PBC easier to manage and it will increase your, you know, it will improve your overall health. Okay. The problem, of course, is that um, is that everybody in, I mean, I'm not going to give a commentary on fatty liver disease at the moment um, because I'm you know, not an expert on it, but it's very interesting. Fundamentally, fatty liver disease is about too much, too much of the wrong sort of food going in and not enough food being burnt, if you like. I mean, and there are nuances around genetics and things like that. But at the end of the day, that the fat comes, it's actually not fat in the diet, it's fat that's made in the liver. Um, and that comes from somewhere. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's controllable by, by, you know, diet and exercise, but that's very difficult. Yeah. And, and it's, it's very common that people will talk about doctors and fatty liver disease, be very keen to put people in drug trials to, you know, treat this. Um, and incidentally, there aren't any approved treatments that work in fatty liver disease but they aren't so quick to do exactly what you've said which is how on earth do i deal with this the way i want to do it yeah. and so you know um diet and exercise is difficult and um you get it's a bit of a you know a bit of a drag you know bit of a you know shark's nest out there you know viper's nest of you know, different experts with different recommendations, often with products to sell, different apps, different diets, different this, that and the other. Um, and so it's really difficult to know what's good, what isn't good, what what people should think of doing. And I think you've hit on something which it's which actually we should maybe think about in the foundation, which is our own practical guidance about all of this, cutting through a lot of the issues with it, because you know, less body weight, less fat in the liver will help with the symptoms. The big enemy, of course, is fatigue because it's very difficult to get going with exercise when you're very tired. And this is where something called secondary gain is very important. In medicine, we talk about secondary gain. So I can sit in the clinic with you and say exercising is really good for you. OK, it'll make you feel better. Um, and whether or not you believe that will depend on your mindset and how convincing I am, okay? Yeah. But, yeah. but it's belief. You have to believe me to go off and do that, okay? That's the primary gain. You benefit because you believe something I've told you because you might think I'm a trustworthy character. Um, secondary gain is when you feel better. OK, when you see your blood tests improving, when you are able to do more and then you go, actually, I believe that not because you believe me, but because you believe your own body. So it isn't a case of getting people you know, having to really help people to exercise and diet for the rest of their life. It's about helping people get to the point where they go, oh, I feel better um, yeah. because then you don't need me to tell you. you you've got the proof in your own eyes. So I think getting people started helping and supporting people is, is something that's very good. In terms of PBC, there's no particular diet type that you need to avoid, okay? So um, there's nothing particularly need to be aware of. Um, in terms of exercise, um, obviously there's something we talk about a lot. There is evidence, um, some of the research that we did, um, some of the research that colleagues in Birmingham have done more recently, all shows that exercise is very helpful with fatigue and then become self-sustaining after a while, but it's tough to get started. And I think supportive programs to help people get going with this would be very useful. What they found in Birmingham is that people felt tons better when they exercised, but they needed quite a lot of support to get there. And I yeah. think there's a lesson in all of that. And I think 
people will be used to the concept of movement as medicine, which um, is, the, the foundation has been is very supportive of. And this is the concept that exercise in your day to day life um, is, is actually helpful for you. So I think some more practical guidance about it might be something that we could usefully think about. So, yes, being lean is good because it takes away some of the things that make it worse. It's not particularly a problem in PBC. PBC weight gain with Urso, we're very familiar with. Difficulty exercising because fatigue, we're very you know familiar with. But our friend's secondary gain, think about it. And I think, you know, do it long enough to be able to think, oh, actually, I do feel better. And it's not going to hit you in the face. You're not going to suddenly wake up one morning able to run a marathon. It, and one of the things we talk about in the clinic all the time is set horizons, realistic horizons. So fix a, a time in the year that's reasonable. If you want to crack cracking with all of this, and we do talk a lot about owning the problem and owning the solution, so you know, really taking charge. Yeah. So what you want to do is to, to pick a date, okay, three months' time that's meaningful for you. So it could be your birthday, it could be Christmas, it could be when you go on some holiday with a family. And then get going and then take a kind of mental picture of where you are that time this year and then you know take another mental picture in a year's time and that gives you the right time frame we want you to think oh actually, i am able to do more i'm you know, i do feel better but it won't you know but i would say it's like tom and jerry you know tom runs into the iron and has an iron shaped face it's not like that it's no. subtle but it's about it's what other people it's what other people say um it's very interesting. I'll tell. I'll just give you an example. So, for anybody who's seen me walk around recently, I've been limping quite a lot because I managed to really trash my knee. Okay, so it's still not been done yet. No, it hasn't. Um, okay. So um, I managed to really injure my knee. So you know, um, the lesson is don't go mountain biking downhill in the Alps with your children when they have an unrealistic idea of what you can do. I mean, you know, the details in the middle don't really need flashing out but it involved very very fast you know contact with very hard ground and the bike landing on my knee turning it in a way that knees don't normally do so I went to see the orthopedic surgeons who told me it was destroyed and it needed it needed surgery and all of that um, but you know NHS we all know about that I walked into the hospital this week and one of my surgical colleagues said wow you're doing really well you know you've got over the surgery well you're walking normally again. Um, and I haven't had it done. In mm. fact, what I've done is trying to lose some weight through watching what I ate and doing more exercise. And lo and behold, it's got better. Wow. I hadn't thought, God, if I would had the operation, wouldn't we be saying how good it is? It took a surgeon to say, God, that's a really good result from the operation. I haven't had it. Yeah. But it, so I hadn't seen the day on day improvement, but somebody who hadn't seen me had. So I think just remember that secondary gain. No, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you. But I think uh, practical things... guidance, just what it's worth, um, for what it's worth, um, if you had Mrs. Jones on the call, um, so Mrs. Jones is a, an anaesthetist who's heavily into metabolic stuff. Um, and she's she's five foot and six stone and is like a little terrier. Um, she's easily per inch of height, the scariest person in the entire world. Um, and she tells me off in no uncertain terms. She is a, an absolute proponent of low carb um, as an approach, absolute proponent of it. And um, in fact, uh, I give away some secrets, is that I've been on a low carb diet since Christmas, um, and that's what's made the difference for my yeah. knee. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and um, low carb works for me now the, the key with diets um the key with diets is is you know something that works for you but i have some experience now i was talking to somebody who i don't know um earlier this week um and i don't know if she's going to be on the call but who has done the zoe program so people may be familiar with the zoe app that emerged during covid in fact wasn't a covid symptom tracker but they used it for that but this is a lifestyle a metabolic support program and and she feels it's made an enormous difference so it's going to bring some information in for me to have a look at but it sounds really interesting because okay. that's principally low carb now yeah. i'm not advocating any particular diet or any particular you know app or anything like that 
because it's an area without much in the way of evidence. But I think it's something where the foundation can collect experiences of people. Yeah. And actually that word of mouth would be very useful. So, um, and the Zoe approach is one that's very similar to what a lot of people in the field are arguing for. And at the end of the day, the fat that gets deposited in your liver in fatty liver disease isn't fat in the diet, as I said. In fact, it's turned into fat. It's sugar that's turned into fat. So it's carbohydrates yep. that are probably the problem. Yeah, perfect. Okay, brilliant. Thank um, you. Maybe you should try and persuade Mrs. Jones to come and join me and we'll have a session on metabolic, how to get your metabolism right. That would be interesting. That will, that will be. So we, as ever, come June, which I think is Nash Day, yeah. we'll be doing a, a Nash special. Um, yeah. And it's worth bearing in mind that when we look at the statistics, so often people worry about PBC and AIH together, autoimmune yeah. hepatitis. Now, the data looks round about one in 10 people with PBC will go on to have um, a, 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 an overlap with AIH um, features. But if you look at the data in the Western world, one in three people have fatty liver. Mm -hmm. So you're actually more likely to have a, an overlap with fatty liver than you are ever to have with, with AIH. Another thing I wanted to add to this conversation, so Gail Wright has done amazing work with the Canadian PBC yeah, yeah, Society. Um, and, you know, on the back of this, we are now coming back out and about. So we will be opening up our self-care um, modules and workshops and all of those kind of sessions again. Um, so do look out for that and let's see if we can get that in front um, of you. And just on the subject of uh, overlap, so it's 10% and going down, okay? Yeah. Because yeah. most of the people that we see, you know, coming through the system with quotes overlap, when you look at them again, um, when you look at them again, in fact, have bad PBC. Yeah. And so I was talking to Jess Dyson, my colleague who, you know, runs a clinic with me. And she was saying, you know, she told me she doesn't believe overlap exists at all. She's been listening to Gideon too much. I believe it exists, but I think it's actually quite rare. She said yeah. she'd seen somebody in the clinic, new referral because they're on high doses of steroids and it's barely controlling the disease. And she put them on OCA and it's all gone back to normal. Okay. Yeah. So, and okay, I think it's, and of course, when we're talking about fatty liver disease, the very, very worst thing you can possibly do is put somebody on steroids because yeah. that drives fat deposition. So if you if you want to have PVC and fatty liver disease together, the very best way to do it is to put somebody on steroids for an overlap that they don't have. Whereas yeah. ochre is probably beneficial for fatty liver disease. So it, 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 that tripartite thing is is really important. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Next question. So I've had a couple. Now, I've, I've been told it's Tudka, but I'm not sure if the U is in there. So we're all familiar with ursodeoxycholic acid, which is yeah. derivative of bear bile. And then I we've been... That no bears are harmed in the making of urso these days. Okay? Absolutely. And, and have been for a long, long, or have not been for a long, long time, particularly. Yeah. Um, now, there's talk of taurine. I'm going to say taurine associated deoxycholic acid. So, you yeah. know, I'm sure you've got the correct term, which I believe comes from our bovine friends, does it not? Is it? Um, so, so, carry on and I'll tell you what I think. So, do you want to finish? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm guessing that's the, again, it's a synthetic um, element that, that is, you know, um, derivative of that but the question is can it be used in pbc has it ever been prescribed do we have any research okay and what is it so tud so tudka is yep. tauro urso deoxycholic acid so it is urso deoxycholic acid to which a a an amino acid um derivative called taurine is attached okay now for ah. Okay. For lovers of trivial facts, um, do you know what the, the the most concentrated source of taurine is in your diet, Robert? Can you do you know that? I'm going to take or in my diet. In your diet, in in things you consume, what's the what? If you want to have more taurine, how? What's the best way of doing it? Vegetables. No, it's Red Bull. Okay. Okay. So Red Bull gives you wings. It's the taurine and it's caffeine and taurine, all right? Well, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right. So taurine is an amino acid. Um, and it, it it's basically a, a modified version of Urso, okay? 
Now, when you take, when your body produces bile acids, okay, and they recirculate around, they get modified naturally. So you have what are called primary bile acids, that's what your body produces. And then they recirculate, they get passed out into the bile, they then go into the bowel, they then get taken up at the end of the bowel and they go round and round and round and round. So if you didn't, you would, you know, run, you know, you'd, you'd use enormous amounts of cholesterol out very quickly. So bile acids get recycled, but they never get recycled in their original form. The body has a little go at modifying them as they go around. So you get primary, secondary and tertiary bile acids, which have different characteristics. OK, but one of the, the processes is called conjugation, where you have something added to the bile to help it recirculate. And one of those things is taurine, okay? Um, the other is glycine, okay? So you have glyco-ursodeoxycholic acid and tauro-ursodeoxycholic acid. So if you take an urso tablet, then most of it will get naturally converted into taro ursodeoxycholic acid anyway. So it is essentially the same in practice as urso. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's no big deal to it other than it's made by slightly different people. Now there is some trial evidence of it being used in in PBC. Okay. Small trial comparing it to urso, and it showed surprise surprise there was no difference between it and urso. Okay. So it is a variant of Urso. It's not widely used in the UK in PBC. I've certainly never prescribed it because essentially it's it's a kind of a, a variant of Urso. Okay. What Urso? What does Urso do? How does it work? Well, it probably has a number of different actions, but it is principally, um, if if we, we might call it a passive agent. So what it does is it your bile acids naturally have a range of different components ranging from really harmful to really safe, okay? That's part of your natural bile acid pool. Um, and basically, in PVC, you have too many of the nasty forms of bile acids, and they cause the injury and probably the itch. And what you're doing when you give somebody urso is basically diluting that out. So if you take more and more urso, then eventually, because the bile acids recycle, eventually it just becomes urso. And yeah. so it's harmless. So it's what you call passive. It's diluting the effect. It's kind of, you know, if you've got a, if the, if if you've if there's somebody you really hate um, who's coming around to your house, if you invite another hundred people, you get exposed to them less. Okay, so it's it's a bit like that. Um, so it does it. It's passive in what it does. And Tudka is basically the same as that. Drugs like Oka are active drugs. So they don't just do that. What they do is actively modify the bile acid pool. That's why they're more effective. So it has a chemical switch function, um, which, which is where it gets its added effect. So it has a little bit of an urso effect, but it's basically an active. So that would be like, um, I don't think Robert liked my explanation. He's now left. Um, so it would be a little like my party analogy, just not inviting the person you didn't like. It's an active process. OK, so it, that's why they're different. That's why they're more effective. Now, you'll read a lot about Urso at the moment and Tudkin because they are the flavor of the month in neurological diseases. So many people will have heard of, um, well, everyone will have heard of Parkinson's disease. Many people have heard of motor neurone disease, Doddy Weir, the um, famous Newcastle rugby player, I would say. I don't know which country he played for, but he was a famous Newcastle rugby player. Um, you know, huge proponent of research in, in motor neurone disease. There has been a trial of Tudka um, and UDCA and Parkinson's that shows some benefit. However, these are, if you think that bile acids are important in these diseases, uh, ochre is a thousandfold more effective. So Tudka, does it work in PVC? Yes, almost certainly it does. Does it offer anything over Urso? Probably not. It might be it's toler tolerated in a different way. So there might be people who'd be better off with it. But if you need a more effective treatment, they are both first level treatments and you need to go to the next level if you need more treatment. So that's Tudka. And everyone in neurology is terribly excited about it. Um, like we were excited about Urso um, 20 years ago. And I'm have pointed out to them um, that there are really much more, you know, like I, like any human being, would like to see better treatment for motor neurone disease. 
and um, drugs like a beta cholic acid would seem to us like really interesting drugs to look at in that setting. Okay. But Tudka is pretty much like her, so. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions with my simple patient advocate head on. And I'm just going to think live and then and then you can take the mic out of me for my thoughts. Um, one, I went to school with Odie Weir. So number, yeah. so number one, Urso is given by dosage per weight. Yeah. And Tudka is available as a supplement. But if we were to supplement our Urso with Tudka, that feels as if there's not going to be any gain because all we're really all doing is overdosing our Urso, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's fair enough then. Right, that's helpful. Second, Let me just to speak about that a little bit, okay? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so it may be the body conjugates Urso for a reason, okay? I mean, it conjugates bile acids for a reason, and we don't quite understand what that reason is. So it might be that it, it's easier to get into the, the body, prefers it that way to get around the system. So it's just not been researched enough to right. know if that's the case. So it, it may be that, you know, the, the blood level you take for a certain amount of tablet will be different with Tudka than Urso. Uh, you know, I'm making this up because okay. it, it it's, yeah, be, behaves in a different way. Okay. Now, what about the dose of Urso? So there are two things you need to be aware of. So there is now clear-cut evidence that unless you're on 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram, you don't have the optimal effect. So historically, we've underdosed people. Um, if you have totally normal liver blood tests on whatever dose of Urso, then you don't need to increase your dose of Urso. Why would you? Normal is normal. I think anybody who's on a too low a dose um, and whose blood tests aren't normal, first book, call is to go for the 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram and Robert will hold up the Urso dose calculator at this point which is um, you have no idea the number of people who've used that who come to our clinic Robert to get the right dose it's people are very aware of it it's a very simple practical solution get your dose right okay there you go he's going to show you a copy of it yeah simple no, no, no. simple and people use it okay and remember, your weight goes up and your weight goes down, so adjust the dose, okay? So underdosing is bad for you. What about overdosing, okay? What about taking too much? Well, there is a trial in PSC, which is a completely different disease, and the same questions we had about Urso and PBC were all asked in PSC, um, and Urso has an effect, but it isn't as clear-cut as is in PBC. And they pushed the dose up originally to 20 milligrams per kilogram, so that's quite a bit higher than we use in PBC, and eventually to 27 to 30 milligrams per kilogram, so that's nearly twice the dose we give. Okay. In that trial, there seemed to be a higher death rate than in the, 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 the sort of non-Urso-treated people, so it seemed to be harmful now i'll be very honest i don't believe that i don't they came up with various different theories about you know bile acid constipation and things and i just think it's one of those slightly rogue results that comes out in trials but there is some data that shows really high doses of urso um, aren't you know aren't safe what i would say is i don't think there's any additional benefit so i think by going up beyond 15 milligrams per kilogram you just take more tablets you get more sickliness and you don't get any benefit so 13 to 15 does look like it's going to stop at the right thing and then if you do read about that extra so the one reason i wouldn't i wouldn't take tudka as well as urso is that if you're buying it as a supplement it's quite an expensive way of, of you know buying yourself a variant of urso and you know there is this data out there that too much urso kind of goes over the top and isn't good for you and it's, it may start to be a little bit like that so i think if people struggle with urso it's a thing to, that might be worth trying but i think if people are not getting the desired result with um with urso i don't think tudka is where i would go i think i would go for one of the second line treatments be it ochre or visa fibrate or you know some of the alternatives so i think it's you 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 know, I would say that um, the the Tudka is level one B, um, if Urso is level one A, and actually, if you if you need to go up a level, go to two, not one B. Okay, perfect. And I'm going to ask my pi equals three point one four two question. Yeah. 
as opposed yeah. to pi equals 3.141, you know, blah, 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 right? So my question is, taurine is in Red Bull. Yeah. Red Bull gives you wings. Other wings <laughs> are available. So if you had fatigue, is it worth exploring Tudka as opposed to Arso as a potential therapy for PBC that could also help with the fatigue? And that's a gross oversimplification of everything. I get that. But I know that I'm not the only one asking that. So I figured it was something that we should maybe talk about. Um, yeah, so you've... you've um... Um, plot spoiler, um, Red Bull doesn't give you wings, um, so it is a stimulant. Um, yes. So it's the com so Tauri in that situation is acting as a brain stimulant, as is the caffeine, okay? Now, stimulants are, they do what they say on the tin, they're all variations and biological variations of the same thing, but what it's doing is, what it's in a sense turning on you know, turning on adrenaline production or mimicking adrenaline production. Okay, so that's what um, caffeine does. It, it's to do with neurotransmitters. So basically, it switches the neurological system. Um, it, it switches the neurological system up a notch or two. Okay, right. So okay. that's so. Red Bull is works it does what it says on the tin if you're driving up the m1 and you're worried about going to sleep then actually it's quite a good thing okay it is not however a solution to a problem it kicks the can down the road so it kind of you know eventually it you know your body's saying you need to go to sleep you need to go to sleep you can put that off by these now we've yeah. got a lot of experience of this with a drug called modafinil which there may be some people on the call who've who've you know an experience of Yep. Modafinil is another stimulant, and what it does is it stops people going to sleep. Now, we know that sleepiness during the day is a big problem in PBC. It's part of fatigue, and it can be a real problem with work and you know social occasions and things like that, people falling yep. asleep on their computer. So every once in a while, it literally is once in a while, we give people modafinil, which stops them going to sleep. Okay, But... Nine times out of ten, people just loathe taking it. Why? Because they feel jazzed up. That's the word people use. They feel jazzy. <laughs> they feel edgy. So what goes around comes around. So the stimulation stops them going to sleep, but it does so by giving them this sort of sense almost of anxiety and heightened yeah. awareness. Yeah. So the problem with stimu just stimulants is not that they don't work. They do but they actually end up with a different problem set that people don't like. So okay. is Red Bull a treatment for PBC fatigue? No. And how we used to use modafinil, and stay, still do occasion, last lady I gave it to, who was worried she was going to fall asleep in the middle of the reception at her only daughter's wedding, which was immensely important to her. And so we gave her a pot of modafinil, said to try it for a couple of days beforehand to work out how it worked. And then take it with you. And if you want to go, to, and if you're feeling tired of the wedding, take it. Okay. And then you'll have your big day. And she did that. And of course, she had a lovely day and she didn't take modafinil. Okay. So it is useful for giving people control of a problem because they have the solution in their pocket. Yeah. But the best thing of all is if they then don't, the empowerment is helpful, but the, they don't need the tablet. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now the taurine argument and Urso is a really interesting one. And I've never thought of that. Um, so could Tantka be a more effective therapy for PBC fatigue than Urso is, which doesn't really have any effect? And I think that's a very interesting, good biological thought. Um, the difficulty is with supplements, it's very difficult to answer that question because nobody's going to fund it trial because you know nobody owns the patent on it yeah. i think this is where what i would call crowdsourced information is very useful i think this is where this is where organizations like the foundation have so much to offer which is that if if you if you take um a treatment and feel better is that because the treatments worked or is it because something else happened in your life that made you feel better we've talked about how tony blair caused 
recurrent PBC post-liver transplant in yeah. past conversations. It's a coincidence, you know, however you know, delightful the thought is. So, um, so for an individual, in a way, it doesn't matter. You feel better. But yeah. whether it works for somebody else is, is problematic. If 100 people report it, then yes, it could be that there's a kind of, you know, belief set developing with all of it, but it starts to become very interesting. This is what we call real world data. This is crowdsourced information. And actually, yeah. after a while, if, if enormous numbers of people report something, then it's more likely to be true. So I think the best way of knowing if these things are useful is for people to people to take it um, and to find out. And remember that um, there are a number of classic examples like operin people may remember that as a painkiller that caused renal problems thalidomide people are familiar with though that information did not come from clinical trials okay the clinical trials showed these drugs were quote safe and effective that information came from real world data from people reporting problems so don't be fooled when doctors tell you that you know trials are everything they're not um, no, no. so well collected information about it and i would be i, I mean i would be absolutely fascinated to hear from people, you know, if they think it's made a difference. Okay, perfect. Thank you. But just watch pure stimulants because you you rob Peter and you pay Paul. I'm with you. Wonderful. Okay, my way of time. We've got a few questions that I need to, to get through. So let, let's see if we can do it. I've got two questions that are really, really similar. So one is a patient who's a bit concerned, they're frustrated with their GP and they don't seem to take a bit of interest but they understand that their blood test should be taken quarterly. So they're looking for guidance. The other patient, similar situation, they feel as if they've been left to reestablish their connection with the hospital specialist. Um, so my specialist has, who monitored her PBC for the last five years has left his position so how does she get in touch to say, look, you know, I've not had a test for a while and I would like to, to have my bloods looked yeah. at. So how, how can we address that? Um, um, before I answer that, this seems like a good moment to say the second edition of my book is published. OK, so if you want to know how to live your best life with PBC, um, I threatened this last week. I was busy boy at the weekend, so that's now online and available. So there you go, shameless plug. That's how to manage your PVC. Um, it's about a third longer than the original version. It's fully up to date, and I think it, it it's fascinating updating it, how much has happened and how much has developed. So it covers literally everything which has, you know, happened right up until, you know, the end of last year. So shameless plug. Okay. So how often, sorry about that. So um, how often do you need your blood tests taken um it depends on what the abnormality is okay so um it depends on the balance of where you are with treatment where you are with severity um at a very minimum everyone needs them taking every year so we would recommend everybody gets a blood test once a year um and then it's either six months three months monthly depending on how fast it's changing but, you know, if it's rock stable and, and relatively mild, then actually every year is fine. What's more important than getting a blood test taken regularly is that somebody actually looks at the bloody results. Um, pardon my French, because the biggest mistake set we come up against is people who um, is people who just don't look at the results. And, um, you know, one of the things that I end up doing, you know, more than I really wish I did was was looking at legal cases about really bad management with PBC. And I, you know, at the end of the day, nobody wants to sue their doctor. They just want to be treated properly. But, you know, sometimes, you, you know, there's no excuse. And time and again, time and again, you come across people who've actually done the right test, have just ignored the result repeatedly, and usually when people have pointed that out to them. And it's indefensible. Um, and people say to me, you know, lawyers say to me, you know, how will this look in court? And I tell them this won't go to court because it's indefensible and they won't waste money going to court. They'll settle out of court. Um, and, you know, maybe that's the only way you get people to pay attention to all of this. So do the bloods a minimum of once a year and look at the results as a doctor and act on the results. OK, and the fail safe for that is for you to look at the results and for you to act on the results as well. So. And that's where knowing what the numbers mean. There's even a set. I mean, this is 
now sounding cheesy, but I put a section in about understanding your blood tests at the back of the book for that precise reason, where we are today, where we're going in the future in terms of what the blood tests show. So you know what your tests are and you know the guidance about what you should be doing. And, you know, we tend to, most of our people come every six months or so, apart from you know, really, really rock stable people. And then obviously if it's changing, we see people more frequently. Yeah. I personally think, um, I personally think that everybody with PBC should be followed up in the hospital setting. So it is, it would be possible for GPs to manage this, um, particularly Urso and Questran are not in any way unsafe or difficult treatments. My experience is though, that it just doesn't happen. So it just doesn't happen. And so personally, I think in the UK, you're better that everybody goes to a you know, at least a local hospital and, and sees a gastroenterologist or a hepatologist who keeps an eye on it. OK, so I think a good if you've got a really good GP, you know, that you have a good relationship with who listens to it and is interested, they certainly can do it. But it's the surefire way for it not to happen is, is my experience. And I think what you do is you go to the GP and you simply request to be re-referred for long-term management, okay? So I think you go to the GP and you request to be referred, okay? And that puts the ball in the court of the GP because if they decide not to refer you when you've requested a referral, then, you know, if this does become problematic, they're going to be in a whole heap of trouble. So just very nicely, very politely say, you know, the recommendation from... PBC Foundation for the International Guidelines for Management of PBC is that everybody's on a minimum of annual follow-up adjusted upwards according to need and that would it be possible just to be referred into whatever the local system is for monitoring. I think good GPs will do that. I think we are potentially, I mean, one of the areas that I think is very interesting is how does digital technology and things help us? So, um, you know, it's an interesting question that we get asked at all is why, why why can't somebody in Truro come and see us in Newcastle if they want to? Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. there's no barrier at all for that. Um, the NHS struggles with, you know, cross territory referrals, but it's it's not particularly a problem. And we'll see people from anywhere in the country that a GP refers. But the problem is, you know, it's not practical to come to Newcastle from Truro. OK, yeah. however, here we all are talking about PBC, imparting information, having a conversation without any of us being in the same room. So the world has changed. Um, we, we didn't, you know, in, in before 2020, every time the PBC Foundation was involved in sharing information with people, it was in the same room. And here we are. And, and what's the effect of all of this? Well, we do revolutionary things to, with larger numbers of people than we ever imagined. So technology is our friend here. It shouldn't be forced on people, but it is an alternative. And yep. it should be perfectly feasible for us to manage people with bloods done by a GP and, and you know, with, with an online presence around all of that. Now, the technology isn't there at the moment, but we're doing a lot of work with the Department of Health on how do you manage people with rare disease. And actually, that's the big thing I've told them is that we won't go from 180 hospitals managing, you know, we won't still be with 180 hospitals managing PBC with the vast majority of people looking after a tiny number. I think you're going to a consolidated approach with a blended thing. Yeah. And I think what, what the difficulty is people are quite anti, you know, telephone appointments when they're forced to do it by a GP for reasons not to do with care or your desire as a patient because of the GP's convenience. Yeah. What we're talking about here is a way of squaring the circle of, of relatively small numbers of areas of real expertise, but geographically, you know, in the places that they are there and how, what's the best compromise for my metaphorical Truro patient? Is it Truro with some education with their GP? Is it a consultant in Truro? With appropriate support is it plymouth where there are good hepatologists but not particularly pbc people is it you know bristol is it exeter where one of our fellows is who you know knows pbc inside out is it you know came and is it birmingham as a, the local transplant unit long long way away or is it you know a digital platform accessing whoever you want and i think yeah. those are really interesting questions for the future and actually um, where people are given a genuine choice, they go for a blended model because, you know, why, as long as it's not me saying, you know, I must phone you up, it's, 
you know, we see people who, you know, from the west of the country, it'll take them three hours each way. Well, six hours of traveling for half an hour, you know, of clinical contact, you know, yeah. there are times yeah. where you don't want to do that. So I think this will, will all change in the future. Indeed. Um, It'll be good to see change in the US because I know, for example, so, you know, if you're in Texas and I'm in Florida, yeah, then your Texas license would be in jeopardy. Whereas if I flew to Florida to see you in Texas, that would be okay. So, you know, again, we're hoping to... Yeah, so I think, I mean, in the UK, obviously, we're yeah. all licensed in to practice across the UK. So yeah. although the NHS in Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales is actually independent, licensing for doctors and for nurses is, is national. So yeah. there is no issue around all of that. It is about, it's about who employs the doctor, okay? Yeah. Because okay. in order to deliver that, you've got to have somebody who's employed... And if the money still goes to the local hospital, but you get your care in Newcastle, then, you know, Newcastle is going to say who's going to pay for the person to deliver that. Now, that yeah. ought to be solvable in a national healthcare system, but it isn't at the moment. OK, so right, I'm going to come in here. So I'm going to firstly speak to Carmen on Facebook. So, Carmen, we run these from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. UK time. Um, <laughs> always with a, a bit of overflow. However, when you ask a cracking question like, why is the itching so bad? They're, they're, we, we're just, so what we're going to do, we're going to save that till next time we get together for a Q&A if we may. But I do have some questions that hopefully will be slightly quicker to answer. And can I just comment on that, why is itching so severe? I'll give a plug again to my friend and colleague, Andreas Kramer, who's going to join me, I think, the next time I do one of these, who is... He is, if you think I'm passionate about symptoms in PBC, um, he is Mr. Itch, okay? Yeah. So you, you, can set the whole, he'll, you can set the whole hour on that question. Okay, perfect. So, so please, Carmen, please, please do, please do wonderful. So Carmen, please do contact us directly and we'll see if we can help you um, with that because that's a big question and we would love to help you with an answer to that. Okay. Okay. Um, Oh, gosh, I'm, I'm looking at time and panicking. I had an MRI recently as my AFP was above range. The result showed no cancer yep. in the liver but pancreatic cysts. Yep. Should I be worried whilst I await findings of MDTM, whatever MDTM is? <laughs> um, okay, so MDTM is multidisciplinary team meeting, okay? Ah, okay, yeah. Um, so in modern healthcare, it isn't just it – isn't, just an individual doctor. So, you know, we're all familiar with healthcare scandals where lone doctors made strange decisions. So we did take much more of a team-based approach. So, for example, everybody having second-line therapy for PBC in Newcastle, that's OCA or Bezafibra or Fenafibra or whatever, um, there is a multidisciplinary team meeting, which is myself, Jess, and our specialist nurse, Kath Houghton. Okay? And what that is is a sense check. Now, in fact, we agree on everything because... because we all know PVC, but it is a sense check and it does mean that more than one person has thought about it. So it's a fundamentally safe way of doing medicine, um, but it can be built up into something, you know, a lot grander than it, it really is. And that can worry people. So the fact that your scan is being looked at at an MDTM is standard practice. It does not mean there's anything worrying in it. If I just put that's really important to say. So an MR, so alpha theta protein is a chemical that can be released by cancers in the liver, but it can also be released in liver disease at low levels. So it's a it's a um, chemical that is a blood test that's sort of sometimes used to look for cancer. It's not very good for that because you can get what are called false positives. Okay, so particularly lower levels, you, you know, can be part just of having chronic liver disease because the liver that's regenerating produces it. So anybody who's got cirrhosis should have an ultrasound scan every six months, and um, we would do an alpha feta protein as well. If there is anything worrying on those, then you have an MRI scan, okay? And the MRI scan is the default investigation. So it's not like, you know, best two out of three. Um, MRI trumps the other investigations because of the technology. So a contrast MRI is the definitive investigation to look for a cancer. So if you had a con an MRI with contrast, and there is no cancer in the liver, then there is no cancer in the liver. Okay, so that's really important. They found cysts in the the pancreas. You know, they need to you know look at them, and I've not seen the scans, but that's an incidental finding. They didn't do the MRI scan to look at that. They've done an incidental yeah. thing, and cysts 
happen all the time in the liver and the pancreas and various different you know, kidneys. And they didn't look for that. The alpha photoprotein's got nothing to do with that, and that's got nothing to do with PVC. So that is a chance finding. So either it's something nasty and it's a complete coincidence, or it's something that's been there all your life. Now, if I saw you in the clinic and you had that result, I would say, absolutely nothing to worry about. We will double check that because that's what we do. Go away, forget about this. And the reason we did the scan is absolutely fine. So I would be heavily reassuring in that situation, but it's that cross-checking. So don't don't sit waiting for the result of that. That's just a, a, a safety cross-check, okay? Okay, perfect, thank you. We've got somebody who's AMA positive. Um, Always had mildly elevated arc force, but it seems to go up and down and up and down, up and down. The hepatologist was thinking maybe a combination of fatty liver or a new medicine is the cause, but I guess they're just looking for um, reassurance in terms of what can they do if their bloods are going up and down. Yeah, okay. So that's pretty unusual in PVC. So AMA pretty much to a um, full stop is associated with PVC. So you can get some antibodies with fatty liver disease. We're talking about fatty liver disease a lot today. You can so, get... So, it, so just to check, it's not the AMA that's going up and down. It's like the Alcforce yeah. ALT. So if you've got AMA, then it's usually PVC spectrum, okay? You can get some autoantibodies with fatty liver disease, but AMA is not typically one of them. It's usually anti-nuclear antibody. So there's either PVC on its own or there's PVC plus something else, but there's certainly some PVC there. Okay. Now, yeah. it is quite unusual for the alkaline phosphorus to go up and down with PVC. It's not how it normally behaves. It tends to be what it is or slowly progressively increase. Um, but if it's abnormal and elevated, I would um, give people ERSO. So I think you've got enough information. If you've ever had a raised alkaline phosphatase in the presence of AMA, I would treat them with ERSO. Um, okay. So if it's PVC, it's going to be effective for the PVC. And there have been trials of ERSO in fatty liver disease, and they show benefit but it's not clear just how much the benefit is, but there's absolutely no reason not to treat it. So in that situation, I would treat with Urso and then see what happens. And if if on Urso it's still fluctuating, then I would suspect it's something else that's going on. And I think, you know, some more investigations of it, but um, that's not typical of PVC, but there's enough in what you've said to, to warrant Urso. And I think you'll find it'll settle down with that. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um... Somebody's been to the dentist, got enthromycin, erythromycin, yeah. but it says in the leaflet not to take if you have liver problems. <laughs> erythromycin is fine. Okay, perfect. Thank erythromycin you. Erythromycin is fine. It's not one of the ones that's problematic. Nitrofurantoin is. Um, remember, lots of drugs will have a comment about um, avoiding liver disease, and that's because they aren't known to be safe. That's not the same as being known to be unsafe. Yeah, yeah. And it's ditto, yeah. you know, don't use in children. So erythromycin I would use in PBC without any concerns. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, kappa, free kappa light chain. Is there a connection with that and liver disease or autoimmune issues? Um, so kappa light chain is part of antibody, okay? So... Yeah. We know that you get a lot of antibodies in PVC, you get the AMA, you get a raised IgM, which is an antibody, and all of those antibodies include kappa chains. It's just part of the antibody. So the question depends on slightly what the test result is. So if it's what's called polyclonal, then it's likely just to be part of PVC that you've just got, they're measuring an individual part of it. If it's monoclonal, i.e. it's all the same, then that's not typical of PVC. And then that needs to be looked into a little bit by the blood doctors as to why that's going. So the results should say, and certainly you can ask your doctor, is this polyclonal and or is it monoclonal? And poly as in lots, mono as in one, and clone is the, the, the type of specificity. So is this just a whole load of, of you know bits of antibody, which you get in PVC, or is it one antibody present at very high levels, which indicates you're getting too many of one particular cell type. I mean, your doctor will fall off their chair when, when you ask them, is it monoclonal, polyclonal, monoclonal? Um, and, but if it's monoclonal, it needs working up. Now, don't you know, worry about it. There's a, um, there's a, it's very common to get these sorts of you know, odd antibody patterns, but it does need checking out. So that's okay. the key thing. Is it polyclonal or monoclonal? 
Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and then a couple of comments, if I may. Number one, somebody's just said that they actually took your book in and quoted it to the clinician when they weren't entirely in congruence with the clinician's decision. So no, good perfect. job. Well done. And somebody say, where can you buy this book? So I just wanted to check. I know Amazon. you said Amazon. And the old edition is now a collector's item. No, it's available if people want to buy the old edition. Um, so it's up there. And if people want to buy the old edition, it's still there. There's nothing, as I keep saying to people, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. There's nothing in that which is factually incorrect. Um, it's however the world has moved on. Um, and there's, there's kind of more content in it. So, but, you know, it's there if people want it. As I say, we... Um, um, you've got to be very careful with these things is sometimes thinking changes and I, ooh, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You know, so, so perhaps some of the stuff in the past about overlap, you'd now look at that and think that's the wrong advice. We now think that's wrong. So there's nothing that's wrong. It's just that a lot of what, of what people now think, you know, isn't in it because time has moved on. So that, that's the point. It's on Amazon. Um, and on as Amazon. I would say, bless Alan, you know, not Alan, um, Bless Jess Bezos. I mean, um, you know, the, the, trust me, the winner from this is Jeff Bezos. Trust me. Um, but those rockets don't pay for themselves. But not, if you not. want to be able to produce something like this and, and for people to be able to get it, then Amazon get a really hard time. But no publisher would publish this because there aren't enough people with PVC. So if you really want to have some, you know, somebody somewhere has got to print copies of it and make it available to people. So, you know, all credit to Amazon. It does it does liberate people to be able to get stuff like this if it's useful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant. So it is the yellow one? It's the yellow one, yeah. Can you show us again, please? Okay, so the old one was a white cover, and this is a yellow cover. The old one was a pinky one. This is yellow. You'll, you'll yep. see them both there. Um, they've jacked the printing cost up for new for newly published books, so that's why the price has gone up a bit. But gotcha. Um, and it's um, so yeah, wonderful. Okay, right. We have recorded. We have broadcast on uh, Facebook. We did come back after the technology. Job done, Dave. Marvelous. Thank you so much and so great we've got questions the, the itch question which we'll, we'll deal with and now obviously we'll do some itch special um when andreas joins us as well um but all well and good so i know you've you've done two this month so thank you very much mm -hmm. for the extra shift it is much appreciated no that's absolutely fine just on the itch note um i think there's going to be some data emerging very soon that sheds really important light on this so the itch itch is really important in PVC. I don't have to say that. Um, it's odd because about a third of people just literally never get it and not, aren't really quite sure what we're talking about. It's, it's interesting. It's one of these things that just because you're PVC, you don't get the itch. And if you don't get itch, you're unlikely to develop it. And about a third of people kind of have it now you come to mention it, but um, it's, it's kind of, you know, not an issue. It's very interesting doing the interviews again, is that, you know, do you get any itch? No, never had any itch. No idea what it is. I mean, it, it's as it's as black and white as that. Yeah. But a third of people get a real problem with it. And I think doctors have tended to over over underestimate the importance of that. I think that's important to say. I think some very good and very important data are going to come out from our colleagues in GSK that I'm helping them with, which is to understand what bad itch does to you in terms of your overall quality of life. Okay, yeah. and around you know just how you can function and things like sleep and things like depression and none of this will come as a surprise to people with bad itch but it will come as a surprise to clinicians and that's really important because it will get people to take this seriously so i think andreas and i are working on that with gsk because it's very it's not about the a drug and how it works it's about what itch does to you and it's it's really important and i think as i say Nobody with bad itch will be remotely surprised by it. But this issue of clinicians not taking these things seriously will help with that. So that might be something we want to talk about when Andreas comes along because of things, yeah. it, it, um, it's really important. The other thing that's come from it, interestingly, is one of the questions that we get asked all the time is what, how much of an improvement makes a difference to patients? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's in, in trial design, it's a really important question because, you know, what, what's the significant difference? 
Now, interesting, when you look at the impact of itch, the answer is any improvement pattern. Okay. Um, so we, we look at a 10 point scale, okay, and we asked, you know, what's the benefit you get from one point improvement? What's the benefit you get from a two point improvement? And so on and so forth. But the largest individual improvement is the first point. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But the largest benefit and two points is a little bit less than twice that. Okay. And three points is a little bit further less than you know three times that. So the incremental gain is progressively less. And I think that is another really important thing, is that actually we don't we we should aspire to make it go away completely. But we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah. And that yeah. any improvement has a measurable improvement in people's life quality. It's really striking and really important. And you're all going, yeah, doesn't he know that already? Well, that's the problem. We have to convince people. But yeah. so I think the message for doctors, which, so we're going to be um, a really strong message for the education is going to be threefold. One is any improvement it matter, matters. So get any improvement you can. OK. The second is with severe itch, sleep disturbance wrecks people's quality of life. So itch and sleep is a horrible, you know, disturbance is a horrible combination. And then third one, which I think is an important message, is watch out for depression because, because people can get depressed with it. And that's really, really important. Yeah, and no. there's an odd trial from years ago showing the drug sertraline is effective for people with itch, and yet it doesn't appear to affect itch at all. And I think that's helping people cope with it because it takes some of the depression away. No, this is not to say people get fatigued with PVC because they're depressed. It's not to say people get itch because they're depressed. It's to say if you have itch and it gets you down, that makes the burden greater. And it's something to think about treating. That's a really important message. So that might be, I think, our friend in America, that might has, has suggested something that we might want to talk about in real detail when andreas joins me yeah no absolutely i'm um, glad you mentioned this because through the app we've actually submitted two abstracts yeah. that dave has co-authored as chair of the medical advisory board um, and these are itch specific so again if you've not already done so and you want to do so please make sure that your voice is included in the itch um survey on the app now if you've already done it it won't be there if you haven't done it, you can find it in the survey section. And remember, um, this is what we, we talked about, real-world data. Okay, this is real-world data. This is the future of medical research. It's large-scale information that comes directly from people. And I think, yeah. therefore, that's that's incredibly important. Incredibly yeah. And if, important. if you ever doubt the impact of real-world data, I know we're completely, completely over time, but if you ever doubt the impact of real-world data, it's actually the UK PBC audit, which has been immensely important. I joined a meeting where a hepatologist from down south, south of England, Richard Aspinall, was talking about why we needed a UK PBC audit. And he cited an abstract from the foundation, which came from patient information. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference that you make. And we can never, ever stress that enough. So for everyone the, that uses the app. And then the audit becomes a stick with which we can beat clinicians and government and things like that. So that's the pathway. Because the audit shows, I mean, we're way over time, but the audit shows that we are very good at some things nationally and we're not very good at other things. And there are some absolutely notable areas where we need to improve. One is about second line therapy. One is about moving people through to transplant units that have got really severe disease. And then the third is around symptoms, because only about 60% of people are ever asked about symptoms. Well, to be frank, if you don't ask people about symptoms, you're never going to treat them. And I think that's shockingly bad, if I'm honest. Um, the other thing is geographical disparity, which is absolutely jaw dropping. And um, I've calculated that if you go south from Newcastle, um, there is a 1% drop off in the likelihood of getting second line therapy if you need it for every two miles you travel. Um, and I think that's not good enough. And it helps explain something which again came from data collected with yourselves, which is about who with bad itch actually gets any treatment. And only 
a third of people with really bad itch in the UK actually have ever had any treatment for it, which is just mind blowing if you think about yeah, it. Absolutely. And actually, if nobody's ever asking people if they've got itch, well, that's no surprise. So before we get really excited about novel therapies for itch, let's just do the basics really well. 100%. And that you will only get bad doctors to be better by constantly chivying them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't listen to me, but they will listen to you. Okay. Yeah. So look and forward to the final on that note is an interesting observation. Having spent seven years in the Department of Health, I mean, that's a whole book in its own right. Um, I can tell you that um, well reasoned letters to MPs who pick up a, a cause is vastly more influential than you think it is. So it's not about, you know, histrionics it's about the well argued letter to an mp who then raises an issue in parliament okay and there's a whole department in, in the ministry of health the department of health that looks at what are we doing in these disease areas and i can point to examples where there's been significant investment in disease areas simply because a sensible mp has made a sensible point in parliament about in inequitable care and i think you know Robert's your man, but but getting slightly angrier about this is is a very very effective tool. But do it in a measured and reasonable way and pursue it. Okay, and getting some MPs on your side it, on our side is very powerful because they ask a question, then it gets looked into, and all of a sudden something happens. And I think you're not talking about vast amounts of money here. You're just talking about professional standards, basically. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. So I was going to say, keep an eye on June because Dave will be working with myself. We'll be working with Mo, and we will presenting data in Easel, um, and making sure that doctors know what they need to hear. Right. On that note, Dave Jones, thank you. On so to our next call. I'll see you then. All Take right. care. Bye now. Bye, Bye everybody.